Hello YouTube, we have a man who needs no introduction, it's Ted Skellum from Dark Throne and we're going to talk about music, gear, songwriting and all sorts of cool stuff. So Ted, thank you so much for uh, being a part of Black Metal uh, Legends and um, yeah, let's let's talk music. <laughs> let's yeah, talk music and sure. gear. So yeah. the first thing I want to start off is um, by asking is uh, your solar guitars, like your uh, signature solar guitar, how did that come about? Um... Well, it's a, it was a friend of mine that, um, you know, uh, we, this, this friend and, and myself has, you know, always been very, um, you know, since we were quite young, uh, had some uh, kind of childish uh, discussions about uh, Gibson versus uh, Ibanez. And, uh, you know, I think in our late forties we just gave up on uh, that discussion. <laughs> but anyway, he uh, he was the one that uh, pointed me in the in the solar uh, direction. Uh, you know, telling me that uh, he had you know played on one and he he had some some other dude he he knew that um, that got one of those guitars and said it's you know it's like really good quality you should check it out. Uh, so I did. Um, but uh, the problem uh, was that uh, I didn't know anyone uh, near here that uh, owned a guitar because you can't just go into a shop and buy those guitars. And and uh, I realized that uh, pretty soon. So uh, I wrote them a mail and uh, asked them if um, if they could kind of point me in some kind of direction to, to try them out or something. And I asked a few other questions and... Uh, and we uh, and they couldn't really help me, so um, so they, you know, so I I thanked them for the answer, and uh, a couple of weeks later I heard from them again, and um, and then uh, you know they uh, they they wanted to um, uh, do something uh, with me, yeah. So uh, and that's why uh, all this came up and. Uh, and it went pretty fast, you know, from from not knowing anything um, to to suddenly have a couple of guitars at my home, and uh, you know, um, you know, I, I was uh, not surprised, I would say, but uh, but you know, it was really good good quality, and I think the. Um, the neck profiles and, and, and scales and everything just uh, suited me very well. Uh, I was, um, uh, you know, used to uh, to play my uh, my uh, my Gibson um, Les Paul for for uh, over twenty years and and uh, so it felt very different, but it was uh, but it was a, a good difference because um, yeah. So I, I played those uh, guitars for a couple of months, and uh, then I went back to my Les Paul, and it felt like very odd, and uh, it felt like an old tractor. But um, then again, I got a professional to 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 set up my Les Paul professionally. I haven't done that in twenty years, so it was really nice to get that back in in shape as well. So now I I play them uh, play them both uh, on. Um, Especially on the um, an album we recorded um, lately. Awesome, that's yeah. really cool. And going back to uh, say the specs of the guitars, because I believe it's um, is it twenty five and a half inch scale, um, twenty four frets uh, with Seymour Duncan pickups, right? Yes, this is yeah. Seymour. Uh, the old, you know the. The classical, uh, what what we used to to call them in the in the eighties, uh, you know, Duncan distortion pickups. I think it's S H six or whatever. Hmm. But uh, those picks, uh, those pickups are uh, awesome, and um, it really um, uh, when we were in studio now in uh, in in April, I was. Uh, I was shocked how good the, those pickups were because uh, they play so 
uh, so raw and open, uh, so you can't really. Uh, 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 it, it was a really pleasant surprise using those in the studio, definitely. For sure, that's really cool. And and like, um, is did you choose Seymour Duncan's purely because it's that that's what you used to, or is it because those pickups give you? Um, a signature sort of sound because this is one thing I wanted to ask you as well is like what is what is the type of tone that you look for and and do these pickups specifically help you find that tone no uh, you see I I, uh, I approach uh, sound very uh, uh, not that specific because um, uh, you know, uh, we have been in the studio, as you know, many, many times. Uh, we use all our, uh, you know, resources, uh, human resources uh, on uh, on actually making music and, and, uh, and uh, record albums. And uh, I think that process for us is... Uh, Okay, we, we, we can have a plan uh, and, and some wishes and, and something like that, but uh, it always turns turn out differently than we, uh, but we have learned not to expect uh, anything, but we, we, I think we like to, to have the, um, uh, the coincidences kind of uh, dictate uh, the outcome of it. So, um, uh, so when it comes to to my uh, guitar tone, uh, I think um, uh, you know I, I played on various equipment and various uh, amplifiers, uh, different guitars, uh, different um, you know pedals or whatever, uh, and it always you know uh, it turn turn out dif different every time, and also. Uh, we have to keep in mind that we we are uh, and kind of an, an evolving band. Um, uh, we have been that since uh, since we started out, because <clears throat> the thing is that uh, we we don't have we don't have the time to to look back or being kind of um, well we started doing that now because we, we feel that we are <laughs> we are coming uh, almost to a full circle because um, you know we are thinking about the demo days and how we how we approached uh, those songs um, and. Uh, we're starting to have a bit of that uh, in our music now, and uh, coincidence, whatever. Uh, we don't have time to look back. We always have to look forward. Um, uh, and uh, when we finally someday just um, just uh, you know uh, lay the band to rest, or uh, if we die or anything, um, uh, then. You know, we can talk about, uh, or other people can talk about uh, what we have done or, or not done or whatever. But uh, it's a it, guitar tone is so much, and um, and uh, I don't remember if we ever have have you know recorded guitars directly into the studio. I can't remember we have done that. Uh, maybe. I don't think we've done that. I, I think the bass has been plugged into the studio because mm -hmm. from 2004 until um, until 2019, 18, uh, I think every album uh, from from the Cult is Alive up until um, including Old Star. Uh, mm -hmm. was the last album we we uh, did on our studio we, we had a we bought a studio in in 2004 so we used that equipment um very um efficiently i would say uh and we don't get back in ah oh, we could do that uh, we could we could have done that a bit differently or we can you know uh, we, we don't think like that um because Every album has its own problems, okay. And um, 
but uh, that's not something we worry about <laughs> because uh, we try to as i said let the coincidences uh, drive uh, the band forward and then uh, that also uh, includes uh, songwriting uh, a couple of times maybe more uh, you know during all these years we have um, we have kind of talked about um, you know changing a bit and i think the the last uh, time we did that as i know of, was uh, after we recorded the the underground resistance we um we said okay i think we we have peaked in this kind of direction let's make it a bit more um you know uh, let the the arrangements okay okay the arrangements of the songs should be a bit more easier to understand. Okay. Not, not necessarily, it's not like a, we have the master plan or anything, but yeah. the, the result is Arctic Thunder, which is uh, pretty much um, a different album. Mm. And from there we uh, we evolved to uh, Old Star and, and, and so on. But you never know because uh, every album will, will probably sound different and will have different type of of riffs and and, and style if i can uh, say that mm. and um we are driving uh you know more and more into uh, you know more classic metal and, and heavy metal and stuff like that so and i told uh, the funny thing is uh i i, I said to to fenris uh uh a couple of years ago and i said um you know, maybe we just end up uh, as a pure heavy metal band. <laughs> and he, his response was, yeah, that's what I've been saying. <laughs> so, awesome. you never know. One, I think the biggest thing before I ask any questions is what you talked about, like progression and moving and how Dark Throne has changed. Because in, in the lead up to this, I've just been listening to like all the Dark Throne I can. Yeah. Uh, you know, comparing the sound of Dark Throne and even the way the songs are crafted since like Soul Side Journey up until um, Astral Fortress. It's um, it's exactly like you said, there is there is real development with the band. And I, I love the fact that you're always moving forward and always focusing on now um, mm. as opposed to focusing on the past, because um, it's like it's a personal philosophy, because I'm I'm one of those people that always tries to find a way to improve on something, whether it's on a like a uh, personality level, physical level, even, but most importantly, in this sense, it's the musical level. So if we're talking, uh, like, if I'm listening to some of the shit that I wrote when I was 14, for example, mm. it's completely different to what it is now. And that just that just shows, um, like, growth and character. And even, like, I'm a much better guitarist than I was when I was 14. And I think and I approach uh, music yeah. well. And I, I just fucking love that. Um, and it's... I, I always find it refreshing when I'm speaking to people who are thinking about moving forward um, as opposed to uh, people who kind of dwell in the past too much. Like, of course, there's lessons to be learned in the past. There is history. Oh, yeah, from history. definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very important to take lessons because. Um, but when, when I think, uh, uh, well, I think a, a lot of people uh, out there would probably I think by now, I think most people understand that we are not going to release another Under Funeral Moon, you know. Uh, but you never know. Yeah. <laughs> as I, as I say. But but the thing is that um, the lessons in the past are really important. And for us, uh, when we uh, still were a four-piece band, you know, and uh, and all the lessons we did take from that, I mean, we, we basically lived in the rehearsal space. Mm. Um, and uh, we developed our skills very uh, efficiently and in a you know in just a, two or three years a lot of things happened and uh, uh, and also uh, when I think back on um, A Blaze in Northern Sky for example uh, one of the 
we just like to say, I mean, we are a band that uh, we are mixing genres all the time. And if you if you take a blaze in Northern Sky apart, that's it's also a, a, a mixed um, uh, genre album. But it sounds like I mean, uh, you know, the 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 cover and and the layout and the sound and and the vocals and everything screams black metal, okay? But uh, basically, it's a it's a mixed genre as well. Um, not to the extreme, but you get you understand what I mean. And um, uh, so uh, and also that album. When I think about it, you know, we were kind of nineteen years old when we we recorded that place. And it seems uh, like a long time now. Mm. We've been more, you know, back then we were, we we just knew what we uh, were set out to do, and uh, and we 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 got, uh, we, uh, we really achieved what we were setting out to do, and uh, and uh, we do that still, but uh, in a different way. I think we have a more, we have a different approach to everything, I guess uh i would say it's like uh you know fenris once said that um uh, i think it was in an interview and anything that um that we don't have any ambitions and i think that's quite quite true uh uh as he also said that uh we had an ambition uh in the demo days and that was to release an album so kind of after Souls of journey we didn't have any ambitions it's <laughs> just uh yeah yeah i don't know no i can completely understand that um like just just going on your most recent point which is the ambition because i felt a certain way um because it's like you you have this goal and then you you spend your whole years obsessing about it especially when you're young you have all this goal you spend ages obsessing over it and then you do it and then mm -hmm. it's kind of like oh shit, what's next yeah and then you're not sh you're not sure what's going on and then um, you try different things and you have this real kind of like deep self-reflection kind of like yeah we had that in the uh, back in 90 i would say uh back in 98 hmm. and 97 it was uh kind of a yeah well it's a bit of a hard time <clears throat> for dark storm but uh we finally <clears throat> We finally got back in the studio again and uh, and after that it's been you know kind of uh, regularly in the studio i mean we could be in studio all the time because we are just brimming with the ideas so uh it seems like it's it's never ending um i think that's that's part because we we just uh, you know music is our life basically and uh, and uh, and since we don't uh, spend any time on on touring or uh, you know doing other things we can just focus on our music and I think that's a fantastic place to be and I mean if we were going to tour back in the nineties or even now, I would think we uh, we wouldn't be much of a band anymore. I guess uh, for differences and uh, you know see each other faces every day. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, no, I can understand. Like, um, like what? I guess it's like I'm trying to think of like the easiest way to phrase this question, but it's like um, the importance of touring and rehearsing versus the importance of not rehearsing and not touring mm -hmm. i think is um but that's one thing i wanted to ask and i think you've just um explained it right there because touring is hard work and especially in the early days uh well you know 20 30 years ago when there's yeah. no internet, you know no google maps on your phone or anything and trying to get by and then mm -hmm. uh, no instant messaging and then you've had like issues with like phone connections and if you need to go to a different country there's all of this stuff that goes on and yeah. and just like you said like the being able to just focus on the music and you know have that time to breathe i guess yeah not being so um so like together with yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. i know and and i think 
uh, none of us likes to travel anyway. So mm. for us, it's a very easy decision. And, uh, and uh, because it's about creating <clears throat> music. And this is what I, this is what I've learned from the early days as well. It's that it's at the rehearsal place, uh, things were happening, you know, it's like, uh, uh, everything boiled, you know, and, uh, everything uh, came together. And, uh, but nowadays we have a bit more, um, we have a bit more, uh, you know, the, the process of uh, making songs are very different. I think now, uh, when we have started to go to a studio in Oslo, uh, we have a bit more time for planning. But uh, you have to remember that you know, even uh, the cult is alive, and uh, and a lot of album after that, we we didn't have. I mean, we met when we were recording, and we we did record uh, in a couple of weekends. That will say that we recorded half the album in one weekend and we um, uh, went home and then we got back a couple of weeks later and did the rest of the album. And we have to set up all the equipment again and, um, well, almost. And uh, that was, uh, and we didn't send each other any, any ideas or anything. We just came to the rehearsal uh, putting up uh, every microphone and, and you know, had the, everything ready for recording. But we had to uh, rehearse the songs as well because <laughs> we, yeah. we hadn't heard each other's riff or anything. So we have, uh, you know, uh, have to learn, you know, very quickly. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's something I've been, um, uh, I think that's fun, you know. <laughs> doing music that way because uh, uh, when we came back from studio last time uh, so many things I mean I'm working very hard <clears throat> in the studio with the with the guitars and I can't you know when I, when I came home I, I couldn't even remember what I <laughs> what, mm. how the songs turn out you know uh, I have to rest for a couple of weeks and then we get something back from the studio and so uh, I think that's a fun way to do music. It's not um, try not to overanalyze anything, and um, and you know uh, still you know uh, on the Astro Fortress album, uh, I wanted to have this uh, kind of a kind of a sticker back on the album saying that uh, no metronome since 1987, and I think that is. Uh, uh, the point of of having that on the album is to explain. Well, it, it's a kind of a partial explanation of of uh, why we sound like we do. And I think uh, you know, I like to play with other people and not with a computer. You know, it's uh, I think that's uh, very uh, two different things. And. Uh, but we know each other uh, so well now in music, so we, we don't really uh, we, we don't have any hurdles in front of us because uh, we understand each other's way of thinking uh, music. Mm. And uh, but we don't have any metronome, so we have to keep the beat ourselves, you know. And uh, and uh, I think that's a fantastic thing because the music is then allowed to breathe uh, a bit. Mm. Otherwise, it could be a bit, you know, a, this is uh, sterile, uh, sterile, sterile, sorry. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I don't speak English every day now. No, no, uh, <laughs> no, I, no, no I, I understand, like, um, because there's, there's something about the, like, the flow of the music. I guess when you're playing, yeah. when you're just jamming with someone, you're kind of like both of you in the zone and both of you need to be completely in sync without yeah. any kind of external uh, external presence, I guess. Yeah. And, it, and it kind of forces you to really lock in um, with mm. people you work with as well. And I absolutely love what you, um, how, how Dark Throne's approaching songwriting now, because there's something so special about 
uh, playing guitar and having things be spontaneous. And yeah. it's like, so for example, like some of, um, like for me anyway, um, like when I'm just playing around, I'm just noodling. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm playing, I'm playing a riff. And then out of nowhere, a, a series of notes just connects. And it's like, yes, I need that riff. And then yeah. those are the real magic moments. And um, I have this thinking and uh, this philosophy where all the, you remember the best riffs. So yeah. when you're playing guitar, you're playing something. If you're able to play it in again and again and again, then you remember the riff. And then that's one that you can use in a, um, in a future song, which, which leads me to uh, my next question, which is like, when it comes to the songwriting and the actual approach to writing songs, with Dark Throne, how has it changed since the early days back in the uh, in the nineties, as opposed to now? Well, um, back in the eighties and uh, and early nineties, uh, we did uh, everybody kind of chipped in, you know, with riffs, and we, we uh, something felt natural. Okay, you have that riff. And uh, and we just uh, we rehearsed a lot, so we, we we just tried to put. I mean, take Goat Lord for uh, an example. You know, uh, that was uh, a very uh, huge task for us back then to to do that. And um, uh, I mean, it, it turned out to be a rehearsal thing uh, on on uh, on the album, but um, the amount of um, effort we did uh, on Goat Lord is uh, quite immense and um, I think also that was the the turning point for uh, especially for uh, Ivar Sefirius and me uh, because we were sitting down in his basement and you know uh, you know listening to I don't know Maltred or whatever and, and we, we kind of we started to talk about what the hell are we doing? You know, mm -hmm. we have painted us. We have we have painted us ourselves into a corner <clears throat> with all this uh, all this uh, technical stuff. And I think uh, we realized then that this can't continue because uh, it's not really what we are. But just yeah, <clears throat> so we 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 just. Um, uh draw out to Fenris and uh, uh, and uh, talk to him and he was uh, very uh, on board with that idea uh, because it's like when a band starts and you are young okay we were kind of 15 16 years old and um, uh, the only thing you really want is to to be a band uh, make songs and get it to work and uh, and of course be good at your instrument it's a very uh, a crucial uh, thing uh, at least it was for us and um, <clears throat> so the band in the early days kind of evolves itself uh, but that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that this is uh, who we basically are so uh so i think uh, yeah that that's the that's the thing so i think goat lord was the tipping point because we, we uh, it was great uh working with goat lord uh it was uh, awesome and um but i think that was kind of the the end uh, because uh we we couldn't see ourselves in the future you know playing even more technical because mm. that was not really who we uh, were uh, i think i think that says it all it's um it's like you guys had this really you were already thinking about like a long-term vision but it but it was kind of like you knew what you needed to change at the time to think ahead in the future even though it wasn't very clear oh it wasn't very clear because uh, i think the the only thing uh, me and sephiros was thinking is that uh instead of all these you know kind of technical things and and stopping and uh the, the sort of things going on hmm. we wanted to see more of the the long lines you know in the music a, a kind of a yeah 
and I think we um, we managed to do that. But uh, then again, and nowadays we can be um, uh, technical in a different way. And uh, you know, as a guitarist, I, I have to I admit that uh, that uh, you know playing. Uh, you know, playing metal and especially, I think, you know, heavy metal and, and trying to be, it's a very, you know, it's, it's very, uh, it's very fun to play guitar when, uh, you know, um, it was not really, uh, I mean, back uh, at the Gold Lord, I'm uh, back at Gold Lord again, but uh, it was very fun then because we pushed this, each other so far mm. on that album that it, it should not uh, be possible. Uh, I think because um, we weren't. I mean, okay, the Salsa Journey was was also a kind of a technical album, but not as you know uh, by far so technical as Goat Lord. So of course we pushed this, uh, each other uh, very far on on, uh, on that album, and and uh, of course we got even better at our at our instruments uh, on Goat Lord. So from there we kind of. Uh, regressed a bit it's like um uh, it was uh, good to play some you know long lines and you can repeat the riffs and uh, you know but uh dark zone is all about uh, the care for and the interest in music in general uh we're not about uh, anything else really so uh well not anything we shall discuss now anyway <laughs> yeah for sure, and I think that's one one thing that Dark Throne. For me, this is one of the charms of Dark Throne's music: is that Dark Throne's music always is what it is, and it's deeply unapologetic about it. Yes, yeah. you guys are recording whatever music. The you, basically, you guys are doing what the fuck you guys want to do, and it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. You guys are still going to go ahead and do it just because you you want it, and I think. Again, that that's the that's the artistic integrity with the Dark Throne, and it's so charming that you guys are just able to just be like, "Yep, yeah." And I think you know this is. I think people, uh, not all people, but a lot of people, uh, get bored with the stuff after a while, and uh, they want something. Uh, really authentic mm. and the thing is that <clears throat> our albums basically always um has been uh, and especially uh, from from uh, from the cult is alive especially from that album uh what you're hearing is basically Dark Throne live, especially since uh, The Cult is Alive. What yeah. you're hearing is live. And uh, people say, uh, you know, uh, some, some people want, want to see us live, but I think to see us live isn't that, you know, fun. But when you listen to our albums, that's pretty much live because yeah. we are actually recording the drums and, and, uh, and the, uh, one of the guitar uh live in studio so that's uh, and that's the heart of of the band and then i uh add the, the other guitars afterwards but you know it's like the it's like this you know the spine of dark one is is live and um and we that we are very honest about uh, things like that. It goes back to your point, really. No metronomes used since 1987. You know, oh. Dark Throne is always so authentic and unapologetically doing Dark Throne, and it's and it, you know you you record live with Fenris, and and that's that's all. I, well, for me anyway, that's all I can ask for from Dark Throne's music, and all I can ask for from the artists I listen to. That it's like the the, I guess in some ways the best version of them or the version of or the music that they want to make shown and expressed in the vessel that they want to make it in. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, you know, uh, I know many people and um, um, in especially in the so-called black metal community are very 
uh, at least used to be very, uh, you know, uh, it has to be, you know, this or that. Uh, but I think, you know, as long as people enjoy music, I don't care what music they are listening to. But I think uh, it, it's uh, it's important to to have music in our lives, and uh, and uh, you know, th there's room for everyone. You know, it's like um, even though I, I I don't listen to uh, well, there's a. <laughs> There's a style of music I definitely don't like, and that's the kind of uh, what I call uh, college metal. Okay, I think I don't, I don't have to mention any <laughs> anything else, but yeah, that really rubs me the wrong way. But um, you know, music. Uh, but I think you know, people are other people are really happy about that music, and okay, that's that's fine. But it's always a safe harbor to come to Dark Zone Camp. Mm -hmm. We have always something for <laughs> everybody. <laughs> oh yeah, no, for sure. Like um, it was really like it was just awesome listening back to all the Dark Throne stuff because uh, it, it's been a long time since I dived into some of the uh, even the earlier works and stuff, and it's just like it's just always like yeah, fuck yeah. There's always something in a Dark Throne album that's just like fuck yeah. Like, this yeah, is... I know, I know. Uh, yes, and probably now we sound uh, we sound better than ever. So uh, we'll see. Oh yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. I'm always I'm always excited to hear um, new Dark Throne. It's always like, ah, oh, what's next? But um, no, that's awesome. And when it comes to um, this, is touching up on one of the earlier points is when it comes to the actual uh, creative process. How does how do you incorporate? Uh, base into Dark Thrones music and like how deep do you go into it and um, what kind of part does it play in Dark Thrones music? Well, interesting uh, question uh, because uh, basically I, I, I have been handling the bass uh, uh, you know, since uh, it feels like, uh, well, first time I played bass on a Dark Thrones album was uh, Under Funeral Moon. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> I think nowadays, uh, and if, if you go back to uh, The Cult is Alive again, um, because when we bought that studio, uh, we bought some equipment and uh, we needed a bass. So we bought the ugliest bass uh, possible because it was cheap, but it served on the albums from uh, Cult is Alive and, and um, up until including Old Star. But then the bass kind of died. <laughs> so you use the same bass from Under a Funeral Moon to the Cult no, is Alive? No, from oh. uh, The Cult is Alive. Oh, okay. Wow, okay. Yeah. That's... Yeah, so it, it, was, uh, it was some years, but that bass did actually deliver, no matter how ugly that bass is, it delivered, uh, you know, decent bass. Uh, but uh, the approach to bass is like, I want Fenris to play a bit bass as well, and he done that uh, sometimes on the, on his uh, couple of his, his own songs or something like that. But um, and now uh, this year we found a um, a different. We have found a much more healthier way to cooperate in the studios, and I think. Um, but so so Fenris also is uh, playing bass. Uh, on the new album, which I uh, appreciate, because uh, when it comes to bass, uh, I think Fenris is really um, uh, at some parts of the music, uh, some parts of the riff. He he, he can um, he's very good at uh, finding uh, stuff, uh, you know, invents something, um, and I do as well. But uh, you know. I'm so focused in studio on guitar, so that everything has to be so precise. And that's basically what I'm doing with the bass as well. I'm going to show you the ugly bass. So what happened to it is like uh, some, I think the electronic uh, just died or something. Uh, gotcha. But uh, it hangs on my wall as a, as a reminder. 
See, that's a that's an amazing timepiece. I love that. This is, uh, as you know, the uh, the signature model that is uh, is uh, you know that, that that we did go for. But this is like the we did two prototypes. Uh -huh. uh, we did a classic version, mm -hmm. which is this. Yeah, uh, that is uh, that you can buy on solar, and uh, and we did a modern version. Uh, so I think the the basically. It's down to the to the finish and 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 colors, but uh, I'm going to show you the modern version that uh, is not for sale. So it's uh, a bit more matte, and you have a, a black. Uh, so 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 it, it's basically the same guitar, but it's uh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it's great. I use this. Uh, I used this guitar actually on the on the new album together with my old trusty Gibson guitar. Amazing. And do you have the Les Paul with you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You see this. Uh, when I first got this uh, oh, <laughs> uh, thing. Yeah. Um, you know the pickups. I think it was the uh, is it the T five hundred that used to sit here and the T four ninety eight here. I'm not too familiar with Gibson. I think so. Yeah, uh, it's right. very classical uh, Gibson stuff, and uh, I was used to that because of my old um, Explorer that I used on uh, Ablaze. Uh, so after a couple of weeks after I got this, I uh, I ordered uh, Tom Iommi signature pickup. Mm -hmm. So I've been playing uh, on this uh, pickup for for uh, twenty years. And uh, at first, I didn't notice much difference, but after a while, I understood that uh, this pickup is, you know, far better than the the T five hundred, and it's also a Gibson pickup. So, Sweet. I, th I think uh, the guy that designed the original humbucker for Tomayomi was uh, uh, taking it apart uh, and to design uh, these uh, new ones, and um, I like that. That's I also changed the. The, oh yeah, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's much more easier to, you know. Yeah, and they look classier, especially with like the um the piano black color of that um Les Paul. I think, and it really matches yeah. the um, pickup as well. That's the, that's amazing. And do you know what's also really cool is that all of your guitars and even that old bass which was used for ages is still in really good condition. Like um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's um. It's a good thing, you know. I, I've been playing. Um, I think my, you know, uh, one of my first guitars was uh, more of a cheap guitars, but I remember the first, you know, decent guitar I had was a uh, was a Jackson. I think it was a uh, Dinky, something. But it was like a anniversary model. I think um, Grover Jackson uh, actually uh, had his uh, signature in. Uh, uh you know uh he actually written on the on the awesome. back of the head on the guitar it's amazing. um it was uh i think that that guitar you can see on the early uh bootleg shows we did uh, it's on youtube you know from i think it was 89 and 90 we could play yeah, the white one isn't we it we played there and uh, then i used the... Hmm? the white one isn't it the white um uh, dinky shape one, isn't no, it? No, it was like a more like a blue kind of uh, it's kind of a deep blue uh, Jackson guitar. I have to look out for that. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it was good, and I you know also own the ESP, and uh, but for me, I think uh, it didn't it didn't uh, really work for me. I think. Uh, I mean the, the guitar was super great. I mean uh, it was uh, it was so easy to play on that it's uh, almost played by itself as I like to say. But uh, one thing I can't stand is um, active uh, uh, pickups. Okay. I have a problem with that. Uh, I don't know why, but I think it's um, I, th I think it's uh, it lacks personality. Mm -hmm. But that's me, and I know uh, other guys as well that uh, <clears throat> you know can be could be sponsored by anything. And uh, I, I understand 
active pickups when you're playing live, I can understand that because uh, active pickups have a bit more uh, what I would call uh, the noise between the strings. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a difficult way to say it, maybe. But um, and and when you play live, you you probably have much more control over um, uh, over active hamburgers. Uh, but when you go to studio, I think uh, basically basically everyone is using uh, passive pickups. I don't know, but uh, I I just know things. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I'm yeah. just curious now. Is there any? Um, okay, what's your favorite Dark Throne riff to play on guitar? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I think it has to. I don't know. Uh, it's very difficult to say because uh, I have uh, good memories of uh, of uh, of all the riffs and uh, all the. All the struggle and, uh, but I think um, it was really fun to play. You know the, you know the last. Uh, every every is is a good thing. I mean, I remember. I can tell you about the uh, uh, the underground resistance huh? because the the last song there is about uh, thirteen minutes long. And we were playing that live as well. All right. Yeah. Um, isn't that and, Leave No Cross Unturned? Yes. 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 Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And uh, th that was a great uh, track to play. And uh, I remember um, after a few tries, uh, we nailed it. Uh, mm. And I, you know, I, I, I could feel my right hand was the uh, was a bit numb <laughs> yeah. after being so concentrated for 13 minutes. Uh, but then we, yes, we nailed it. And uh, then I was back in the saddle again, putting <laughs> on the second guitar. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's all, uh, it's all good memories. So that's, all, that's, yeah, that's one of my favorite riffs um, in your catalog. But I, my favorite Dark Throne album is Astral Fortress. Yeah. Uh, the reason why so the reason why it's uh my favorite album is is because for for no matter who i'm with or whatever mood i'm in it always just hits it always just hits right just when you go for a even on drives to work like i listened to the the whole album um this morning on the way to work and you know you set off early in the morning you're a bit groggy and you've got the acoustic guitar parts coming in and then it just it just makes the journey feel more like a journey. Yeah. I mean, well, that's uh, yeah. that's very uh, nice of you to say. I mean, um, uh, and you know, the the thing that um, really I I listen to a lot of folk music. Hmm. I've been doing that for uh, for years, uh, and it 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 just proves that uh, music is uh, a universal thing, and I think. Um, uh the mood you are getting into is uh because of what you your surroundings is uh, is different from mine mm. and but we all understand its appeal and i think uh that is a great thing about music you know it's um everybody has that in common yeah for sure because like so, music is... uh, except for some countries that uh it's not allowed to, to of, of course yeah it's um it's one of those things like music is always one of those things that speak to people and different yeah. music speaks to different people. But I love, um, dude, like Astral Fortress, some of the, um, some of the songwriting in there is just fucking class. Like you got stalagmite, stalagmite necklace with that really kind of, um, you know, that where it just kind of like feels like it's sinking and then you've got yeah. keyboards and stuff on top and then yeah. Da, na, na, na. And you get the fucking big riffs afterwards. Oh, yeah, like, well, thanks. That's so that's great. great. And then you nice got... really good to hear. I think uh, Astral Fortress is uh, you're going to get uh, more of uh, more of that kind of uh, style. But uh, you know, every album will will be different and. Uh, and um, but we are on the on the journey to something that we 
believe is um, is uh, really a, we, we have a good path ahead of us. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to everything. <laughs> oh, sure. I'm looking forward to go back in the studio once again, you know. But uh, we have to uh, we have to keep calm now and not uh, not get stressed out. The sea beneath the seas of the seas, yeah. The sea beneath the sea seas of the sea, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's my favorite Dark Throne song. Yeah, nice. But you know the first riff, you know. Yeah. Who did you write that riff, or was that a Fenris riff, or was it? Oh, that's a that's a Fenris uh, riff, but I'm playing it on the, of course, on the album. Yeah, I think that would. Um, yeah, it's just the way that whole song just flows is just, mm. it's just pure magic. Yeah, it, thanks. It, and and you know, uh, th this is one of the the things that is happening in Dark Show now is that we uh, we have found a different way to. We are uh, sticking our noses into each other's songs um, in a in much more. Mm. So uh, uh, I don't think it will. Uh, I think you know, on the next album it, it will always say that it's uh, music by Dark Song. Mm. And uh, we found a kind of a golden thing that we haven't done before so uh so it will be interesting to see the reception of that album wicked no i'm yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited and um when it comes to dark thrones albums dark throne albums always have like this cohesiveness in the sense that every song is every song kind of flows perfectly into the next one was it is that an intentional thing uh, when you make albums? Um, because are, are you already thinking about like the album as a complete package um, before you write the songs, or is it the no. case? Okay. No, that that's not the case. But the thing is that uh, when an album is uh, is uh, done recording in studio, uh, the next big questions down the line is is uh, the order of the songs. And uh, we put uh, really much uh, thought about it because it's it's very important, and uh, and we know it's important, and um, we're always uh, taking that very seriously because um, it's something about what is the first thing people will uh, hear on the album, you know, the first song, the opening song. It should kind of uh, we think it should represent the album. We try to, to to pick a song that can kind of represent the album a bit. But it's very difficult because the songs are different. And uh, but the first and last song is really important to nail. And we are all we are, you know, even narrowing it, narrowing it down to to vinyl. You know, mm. I mean, uh, which song should be the last on side A? You know. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, thought process in that, and um, I usually uh, rely on Fenris on that because I think he he uh, has even stronger opinions uh, uh, on that than me. But um, if I, I mean, if we are really, really, uh, you know. Uh, don't think the same way we we have a discussion and um, and we settle with something mm. so but yeah it's important because as as you say it's uh, we're trying to to make it uh, as you say coherent coherent whatever so that's what we are aiming for because uh, it's important to have a good uh, package and, and and taking the listener down a, a certain road yeah 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 for sure because there's nothing worse okay so this used to happen to me because i um 
when I was um, in my teen years, I was like, no, I, I, <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not going to listen to Spotify. I'm going to buy the albums and, and pay my money, go to the shop, get the thing, get the physical thing and listen to it properly. So I used to buy a whole bunch of CDs. And there was so many times where I was listening to the CD and then it's like, yes, the first three songs, amazing. And then the rest of the albums falters or there's nothing. Yeah. I just can't stand that. So <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that has been uh, a bit of a problem, mm. uh, and I think uh, you know you have to remember that that uh, I would guess a lot of band uh, just go on autopilot uh, uh, um, a lot, and uh, and that's what you're getting and uh i don't uh, remember this monstrosity whoa what's this yeah that's the it's like uh you know very I, I use this guitar for uh you know i i recorded uh, a couple of uh guitar fills or solos back in the i think it was circle the wagons or something uh so uh, yeah it's uh it's a cool guitar to have. That's uh, insane. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. That is that's quite a piece of work. Who who made this? It's an American dude. Uh called Icon Guitars. No way. And it's got fuck off and die in the fretboard as well. That's Yeah. That's a really special thing right there. Fuck yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of uh flat. Yeah. So this is like um, made with uh, what do you call it in English? It's like a, it's a cast of some kind of yeah. sort. I think it. Uh, I can't remember the the name of the of the material, but it's a uh, it's fun to 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 have that guitar actually. And, yeah, I, and, and even the the pickup is uh, very um, what do you call it? Uh, Necrobucker, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like uh really low output on them. Uh -huh. So it's kind of uh it's a it's a it's a fun guitar. And uh and you see the, the, the flatness of the you know it's not rounded, it's just flat here. Yeah. That's quite a thing. That's um that's a really interesting neck. Because I've I've played guitars with flat necks and um yeah. they're really comfortable but uncomfortable at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know. This uh, this worked out uh, quite good for me, and uh, hmm. so. Uh, but you know, I c it's fully usable, and um, but I haven't used it on. Uh, I think I used it on. It was some album I I recorded. Uh, no, it's not. Probably it's it's not the uh, uh, Circle the Wagons. Is uh, is probably later. Hmm. I can't remember when I got this guitar. Yeah, it's a it's it's a fun thing. What made you want to pick up the guitar in the first place, and who's your like number one guitar hero? Oh, um, I think I picked up the guitar when I was like uh, maybe uh, twelve or thirteen years old. Um, I can't really. It was the it was the again back to the to the interest in music and and bands and you know and. Um, I, th I thought it was like um, just some interesting. Uh, I think it was. I was very interested in in knowing how they could, uh, you know, play cool riffs, you know, because I saw that it's possible <laughs> with uh, when I saw a music video or anything. And um, but I think uh, you know. It's hard to hard to you know uh, to to say who's my guitar hero, but I think uh, that there's a lot of them, definitely. And um, because I I heard so many bands and but I you know I have to say that uh, one of the really cool riff makers is uh, of course uh, Tony Iommi. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's, you know, Black Sabbath was like, you know, 
I like to see the the I saw a kind of an unedited version of um, Black Sabbath in 1970 playing in in par Paris, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the people that came there, some of them didn't really know what to expect. I saw kind of old people, you know, children, <laughs> but, uh, and they just stood there and was like miles ahead of the time, you know. And um, so, so uh, you know, Black Sabbath, and I even, you know, uh, you know, bands like uh, I don't know, Thin Lizzy uh, was uh, great, and uh, there's so many bands. I mean, even early Accept, I, I really like the um, the Restless and Wild album for Accept. It's uh, it's great. It's not the uh, an inspiration for my uh, you know for, for guitars but it, they had a lot of good riffs and and I, I like that album maybe uh, yeah and um, so uh, you know Fast Eddie from Motred was also kind of a, you know fantastic um, and you have all these uh, older guys like uh, you know I'm, I'm kind of a nerd on this because I like a lot of music you know even old you know jazz uh, uh, things and uh, you know it's like uh, when, when I listen to B.B. King you know for example I can listen to uh, the uh, the now late uh, Jeff Beck hmm. uh, I mean he Jeff Beck you know Roger Waters did this album Amused to Death and uh, when he was making that album he 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 came with the absolutely best solution to the to finding a the right guitar player, and that was Jeff Beck. It, it was uh, it was mind blowing stuff. So there's a lot of I mean the you know the, the guitarist of Rush as well. It's like uh, you know nobody talk much about him, but I think he's uh, he's a fantastic all round guitarist. I mean it's um, it's amazing. Also, you have a riff maker like uh, Jeff Hanneman. Oh yeah. yeah, you can't really. It's, <laughs> I mean, uh, the stuff he wrote was like uh, out of this world. It's interesting you mentioned Tony Iommi because I there's a big kind of a, I, there's a type of parallel between Tony Iommi and Dark Throne is that well Tony Iommi's riffs in his era of Black Sabbath when if we're talking just about like big riffs. Mm. Like um no, it's interesting. I was listening listening to like Paranoid recently as well, the whole album, and all of the riffs are, you know, statements, really, really strong statements. Yeah. If compare and if we compare something like um like War Pigs and we compare that to something like even in the in the in the Shadow of the Horns, or even like Leave No Cross Unturned, or even um uh you know, Static Might Necklace, there's always that big emphasis on just fucking piecing together cool riffs, but making sure that all the riffs work and flow together. Yeah, and I think you know one of the things I have been um, uh, thinking about this is uh, not thinking about, but it's it's obvious because <clears throat> for me it's it's much more easier to to write a complicated riff. Because then you have a, you can add, you know, a lot of entertainment along the way. But to make a really, really simple riff and to make that work, because that simple riff should carry the whole thing forward. That's hard. That is, yeah. That's really... a lot harder, <laughs> I tell you. It's, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The, the, uh, and um, when it comes to guitar playing, I, I've been... For some years now, I have been pondering a lot uh, about I'm I'm so you know I'm so grateful for not being an educated guitarist, and it's because some of the things we are doing. Uh, if I was a, if I was like a high graduate guitarist, go to school for ten years and so on, there's a lot of things we do that uh, we probably wouldn't do because then I would get questions in my head like, can I really play this? Because 
people might think I'm not. Uh, I haven't. Uh, maybe they 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 think that I haven't go to school for ten years or to learn all these things. So that's sort of um, it's just being very. Um, I avoid all those things because you can do whatever you want, and it's it goes uh, also with my solos because I haven't really. I know the guitar and how it works and everything, but uh, I have no clue. <laughs> on the other hand, I have no clue what I'm doing at all. Uh, to to put it a bit uh, silly, you know, but uh, um, it's good to go uh, to think outside the box, and I think that's that's where we belong, and um, and I think that's also the creative sphere um, mm -hmm. uh, for us. And uh, also, obviously, uh, for Black Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I won't compare Dark Moon and Black Sabbath because, uh, but you understand what I mean. That's one thing that I tell a lot of my students and even the people who watch the, my channel is because it's like, yes, I do teach music theory. Yes, there are certain scales that can make a more evil sound, certain notes that sound mm -hmm. more, um, certain scales and stuff that do sound more kind of like epic or colder, if you will. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, fuck all that <laughs> yeah forget about it because all that all that is is a tool to help you learn and to understand what you're playing but i th yeah. really think that the true like it's so hard to teach creativity um and you can't yeah force someone to be creative either it's oh, you said it you said it you can't uh, you can't teach creativity and that's uh that's a very good uh good point and uh I also been a guitar teacher. I also were a drum teacher at uh, at all points, and um, uh, and it's fun, you know, to 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 teach stuff. But um, I was teaching more like, uh, you know, how to understand the guitar and uh, and you know, uh, much of the basic. But uh, the thing was, uh, it was really fun to to teach drums hmm. because, um, you know. I, I would say 99% of the earth population have some kind of written sense in them. And uh, and drums is like, uh, compared to a guitar, okay, you, you, okay, you're going to have this chord or whatever. And uh, people are struggling to get their, their fingers right. And then they, and then they, uh, you know, slap the strings and it sounds kind of awful. Uh, because it's it's much more um, uh, difficult instrument, but when it comes to drums, when you hit the drum, that's exactly how the drum is supposed to sound. And uh, so it's a it's more of a thing that uh, you know to to coordinate everything. So yeah, no, for sure, I had no idea you were a drum teacher. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was for a couple of years. Yeah. Oh wow, cool. No, I had no idea. I had no idea you were a guitar teacher as well. I, I just no, yeah. I just... Oh, it, it, it was it, it was very kind of basic stuff, but um, it was fun because um, that's something also I can uh, you know I could learn from uh, you know uh, doing that thing. So uh, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. But, uh, so are there any guitarists out there right now that you um that you keep an eye on or you just really enjoy listening to or you think they have really um, or they make really cool stuff? Uh, uh that was a really difficult question because um uh nowadays uh well for the last uh, 5 years or something I haven't been uh, listening to much music, but I know uh, Fenris is sending me some some stuff uh, once in a while that I think is really great. But uh, there's no uh, particular guitarist I I um, I have uh, my eye on. Mm -hmm. No, uh, uh, thing is that uh, I've been very. Um, I think silence is uh, is my new uh, kind of music. Uh, I like silence. Um, but uh, uh, when I listen to music, um, I uh, I put on some some vinyl, and it's uh, always kind of mostly seventies and 
uh, 80s uh, stuff, but uh, and, and even 60s. But um, yeah, yeah. No, uh, I, I I don't have my eye on any 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 particular guitarists actually. And or what about any particular bands? Well, no. Again, it's 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 just the 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 the, the old timers. You know, I'm I was. Uh, I'm very uh, rarely at a gig as well. It, it's, it's happened maybe a couple of times a year. I was seeing uh, the residents from the United States. You know that band? Uh, it's very um, uh, no uh, the residents. Um, I think they started in the late sixties or anything. It's like a um, it's like a people came together to make music and art and stuff like that. So it, uh, it released a lot of albums. That was uh, great. It was uh, near where I live. And um, also the the band from Norway in Trondheim called Motorcycle. Mm -hmm. I was seeing them a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I think that also was uh, really great. I think uh, Motorcycle is probably, probably the band in Norway that uh, we have most in common with. Uh, I think uh, not musically necessarily, but um, but the way of thinking music and uh, and uh, be able to to change yourself and and uh, do what you want to do kind of attitude. Yeah. For sure. No, that's really cool. And that got that got me thinking about um, another question. And um, how much of an influence was Euronymous and Blackthorn to your playing? Uh, Euronymous, uh, not at all. Uh -huh. I mean, we, we, I had a, you see, we, we have a completely different approach to, to music. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, we were friends, friends with him. And, uh, and I remember even, uh, he was, uh, I think, um, Euronymous and, uh, and Ted and, uh, Hellhammer and those guys were, we had a kind of a private release party on Salsa Journey. They were there. Ooh. And uh, we had we had we had a blast. It was great, and um, so. Uh, but uh, people um, often uh, mistakes. I mean, uh, the the question you asked now is really interesting because I had a, I had actually a long chat with Fenris, uh, you know, a couple of months ago about this uh, this issue, and um, uh, we just. You know, we, we we just agreed on that we are never escaping this kind of uh, things. Mm. Uh, you know, even how untrue uh, you know uh, claims that that people come with. But uh, when it comes to um, uh, to Euronymous as, as playing or 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 Mayhem as a band, uh, it was never any inspiration for us because. All you have to do is just to listen to the albums and you understand the differences uh, mm. straight away. But we were in the kind of a same, you have to remember that uh, Norway uh, back in the day was very, there weren't any, there weren't m many bands. So the few bands you uh, you knew of uh, in the area, of course, you you try to, you know, it, it was good to, to to meet them and you know uh, just having a good time uh, we never discussed music as such hmm. you know? yeah and that that's um that's a really really interesting point um because because that's one of the reasons why um i asked the question in the first place is because the music dark throne makes is completely different to mayhem and i was just um I was just curious, but then it goes on to an even more important point is um is when you hung out with with um the musicians you weren't talking about music it was always about like other stuff and i think that's just so cool because when i'm when i'm hanging out with you know some of my bandmates and some of my friends you know we barely even talk about music and i yeah. quite like that i quite like having um you know you've got something that you all of you guys are all passionate and you you know like your shit about but then you're able to talk about other things and yeah <laughs> and, and I, I find that so much more um it helps create more it helps expand your mind and have more open conversations. Absolutely, and uh, you know, Fenris and me, we are uh, we have uh, very much contact now uh, on the, on the you know SMS kind of things. But uh, it's funny because every spring and summer we are uh, texting 
I think uh, a lot of things, uh, some music, mm. but especially in the spring and early summer, we are talking about uh, we are texting about gardening. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's uh, that's yeah. how it's uh, become. You know, we have to <laughs> we have to keep our gardens. But he's he's very um, much more of a gardener than I am. But um, we have uh, I have to take care of the things myself. So yeah, okay. that's a good thing about. Uh, so so we, we we can talk about a lot of things and mm. um, yeah. But uh, we don't see each other much, though. Uh, I mean, we, we usually meet, you know, w when it's something uh, regarding Dark Throne and, and, you know, photo sessions or, uh, you know, uh, studio work. And, uh, hmm. But I think we should, uh, you know, try to hang a bit more out now because uh, we, uh, we have come this far and, uh, and we're good friends. Mm. yeah no for sure no that's um that's really really good to hear and um and that's the thing it's, it's hard to think of dark throne without you two and it's just like it sounds silly but it's like you know you two are dark throne but it's it's more than just dark throne it's 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 almost a, a sense of family yeah it uh you can f i mean we are used uh, most of our lives in this band and uh and it's just become a part of uh, who we are, I guess, uh, because um, um, I mean, since I, since I, uh, yeah, well, for, since I joined the band in the, in early '88, I was uh, I've been thinking about this band all the time. I mean, uh, every day I think about the band, and. Uh, so it's been a really uh, for me and and also you know just to 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 have this uh, thing in my life has uh, probably uh, you know uh, saved me from uh, going mental sometimes um and I'm, i've been so fortunate as well i mean I, i've been writing some lyrics when i really have something on my mind um but uh, Fenris uh, lyrics are uh, exceptionally good, and I've been, you know, lucky to have those lyrics um, that I could, you know, do the vocals for. And uh, so, uh, yeah, he's uh, he's brilliant on the on the lyrics, definitely. Now we're talking about lyrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't so, this supposed to be about guitars? Yeah, yeah. But this is this is the thing. Like it goes back to talking about more more things more open-minded stuff so um yeah because admittedly like dark thrones and lyrics i haven't looked into so much because i'm one of those people that when i listen to music um lyrical content is the last thing on my mind mm, yeah. when i listen to music but that's just that's just my kind of perception so um yeah let's yeah i think lyrics is a good thing to talk about so the lyrical themes from um, from Astral Fortress, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, like impeccable caverns of Satan. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I, I I I don't know what all the lyrics are, but what was like the um, what was like the intent with? Um, well, that, uh, you know, we are, we have a habit of not uh, commenting on lyrics because okay. uh, first of all. Um, and the lyrics are very uh, personal, uh, mm. and and also uh, it's much better that uh, people interpret the lyrics their own way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because if I say <clears throat> that you have to think this or that, uh, it kind of ruins the experience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so, uh, but uh, also Fenris are also changed. Uh, you know the you know the lyrics uh, and um, this is uh, this is uh, because over 35 years you of course uh, you grow and you, you you experience a lot of things uh, and and and, uh, and the, the lyrics are a result of that and uh, I, I don't 
I can't remember last time I made a lyric for Dark Sun. Uh, I know I made some, made a few on the underground resistance, and uh, and uh, that was because uh, I really had something to to write about, and um, it's very personal, but it's uh, always uh, packed into kind of a lyrical theme that uh, to try to you know disguise what i really saying you know how do you feel when other people cover your songs oh that's um i think that's great i oh, think cool. that's uh yeah i think that is awesome because uh when i when when we started out i think we were basically very pleased if someone even understood what we were doing hmm. And uh, I think that's uh, that's great. I heard a lot of uh, good cover songs, and uh, and uh, so it's uh, I see it as a as an honor that people want wants to play our songs, and uh, that we made kind of an impact. And uh, I think that's uh, that's great. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Even though, even though we we we're kind of. Uh, <laughs> you know to to expect that everybody should understand what they're doing is uh, of course uh, silly but um, you know as I like to say uh, since we if we haven't done anything drastic uh, to get attention or whatever uh, we're trying to push the music uh in front of ourselves because that's who we that's what we like people to yeah mm -hmm. so uh we have done this uh, and and also because of the music we make uh, it's a it's a kind of an uphill battle uh, from the start but as i like to say that um we have had a positive curve like not like that but like this in 35 years and it uh i like that hmm. because we try not to to um to get attention uh of other things than than the music and um you know now we are talking about i think i think this interview is really nice oh thank you <laughs> yeah that's great no i'm i'm, I'm happy yeah, because yeah, it's like uh, we're talking about gear, and this is things I know about, mm. and um, <clears throat> and that's what I do. You know, it's uh, so it's it's good. It's all good. No, I no, like this. I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, all good. No, that that's the thing. Like, um, it's it's like I said to you before. It's like your your wishes are paramount, and I don't want it to be like some stupid bullshit conversation about oh, i mean uh you're uh, you're a really nice uh nice guy and uh you know i like this okay no that's yeah. all good and um yeah no i i just think it's great um because this is I, I was having a conversation with uh shalva andre um of uh svartelda and playing 1349 and um you know since since the uh, chat we had for black metal legends we were talking we, we were still kept in contact and um talked about like music and had like little chats and it's always fantastic because the um the way it, it's, it's very similar like the way you guys um are um are explaining music now and it's always letting the music always speak for itself and i just think that's fantastic and it's just about being as creative as possible and trying to push your own sounds and let more of your own personality be expressed in the music um, yeah. as opposed to try to imitate others or um, do something that isn't authentically uh, yourself. And <sighs> I think that's a big, big thing that the... Um, for me, like that's a big thing in the current black metal scene and market right now. I think more people need to try and be um, themselves in the sense that they're making the music that they want to make rather than trying to sound like someone else. Um, yeah, I know what you uh, I know what you're saying. And uh, and uh, of course, the bands that are going on tour all the time, uh, they will probably make uh, more of the same albums 
because they are going on tour you know it's like um, and uh, i think it's it's nice for us to to not have that kind of distortion uh, <laughs> around ourselves and uh, but i mean um, every man to himself and um, uh, and woman <laughs> yeah sure. and, uh, so uh, yeah i think it's uh, it's all good i mean there's a um, there's a place i guess for everybody and uh, you know and uh, but i i understand that live is very uh, you know a popular thing but uh, i think live playing and making albums are two completely different things yes, yes. because i think playing live is more of an you know it's more of an entertainment uh, business and uh, I think uh, at, at least my philosophy is that uh, uh, when we quit or die or anything, uh, at least we have the albums, you know, uh, that we have made the, the, their mark. And, and uh, because a live uh, show is, is like, um, yeah, it's what it says is a live show. And, uh, and then it's over, mm. basically letting the music breathe it, yeah. and, and what i mean and what i mean by that is um because if it's like you said if you're playing live then really you're just focusing on the songs that you're performing um because you've got to get those tight or whatever and in some ways there's less to go wrong in a live show um and there's more to go wrong in an album because there's uh, even though it's a very very similar setup it's just somehow like the album is one of those things that requires a lot more thought and a lot mm. more process because effectively with a live show you know if we're talking like real fundamental ground level it's musicians gear and uh yeah musicians and gear basically because i was thinking like speakers and microphones that's all part of gear right yeah. uh, and equipment but then in the studio you've got musicians gear and then you've also got like sometimes living at the studio and then it's like like that little fine bit in a take that can go wrong or like you're playing a chord and you uh touch the strings and it makes like a weirder sound so you need to try and do that again yeah, yeah. there's more little things to go wrong in in the album and um having that breathing room to really think and um still rehearsing and still spending time to craft each song um even at home or with other musicians, I think is um, so much more, well, it's it's a harder thing to finish. Yeah, because what you're doing in the studio is going to, going to uh, kind of, that's it, you know, it's mm -hmm. a very final thing and it's out there forever. And uh, so uh, so so the studio work is is really uh i remember both after i mean every album and uh, but i i would i would say especially especially uh you know eternal hails and mm. and um and uh astral fortress um and there's so much uh, work for me and when I get back home, uh, I'm just extremely exhausted, you know, because you have to be, try at least to be, uh, you know, on, on your peak performance all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, th there's so much uh, in, when we are in studio, th th there's a lot of um, things uh, that we can uh, do or change or, uh, uh, so I have to be, you know, uh so concentrated all the time um so you know what i like to do is uh when i get back from studio i i could probably sleep for a couple of weeks but uh i suddenly realized the morning after i get back from studio that i can't sleep you know, two weeks because there's a lot of things to do and um so yeah it's uh so the beard is getting all grayer and whiter for each year and that's probably uh probably the age but also uh, the it's a concentration thing yeah no i could understand that completely because 
uh, when what I'm tracking. See, I'm I am fastidious when I'm tracking guitars. Like I'm one of those people that's like, you know, say if I'm recording two guitars, I've yeah. got to make sure that they're absolutely in line with the grid because, um, because yeah, it's like the way I record is with, um, you know, I just go straight into DAWs and um, try to make everything as tight and as uh, as as tight as possible. And that mm. requires just so much effort. And yeah. Something's like even slightly off by a tiny bit. I'm like, no, that shit, I'm going to fucking do it again. Yeah. And then I spend like the next while recording the same thing. And it's, it's so physic, it's so mentally demanding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes physically as well. If you're tracking something really, really, really difficult, um, yeah. it's hard work. Like, um, it's, it's really, it's, it's very hard. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, I mean, I mean, the fortunate thing about Darton is that I think it was uh, either it was uh, on the album called um, Dark Thrones and Black Flags or it was Circle of Wagons. I can't remember which uh, which album. But uh, when we recorded that song live, you know, one guitar and, and, and drums, um, I think I can't remember if it was me or Fenris that got confused in the middle of the song. I think it was, uh, it doesn't matter. Hmm. Uh, but the result is that I, I was, I think it was me that got confused because I was, I was uh, thinking that now the next part is coming, but then I just uh, hold the strings and, and Fenris kept on playing. And, uh, and then I, uh, we just came together again. Uh, but instead of changing that, uh, we kept it like that because it sounds deliberate. Hmm. But if if, if it uh, has been, if it hadn't sound any good, then we will uh, of course do it again. Hmm. But it was like, um, uh, but people think that that's how the song is supposed to be. Hmm. But uh, that's that's a. Uh, that's the luxury of being in Dark Souls, you know. We just let the, as I told you, uh, in the start, that um, you know, coincidences is really is is really nice uh, thing for us. Yeah, for sure. Because um, there's times when I was I was playing, I was playing a riff, and I accidentally played like a wrong note, and it somehow worked better. Like yeah. happy accidents, and those things are so important. And that's why it's like it's going back to making riffs. It's like you've got to have spontaneousness. You've got to be able to like just like just playing and playing and work subconsciously in a way. Yeah. Uh, not overthink it too much. Don't worry about what the notes are, but worry more about how you are playing the notes and don't really worry about what's next. Um, and you've just got to just just keep playing, keep playing because the riffs will yeah. come. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. uh, it's that... a, it's all a matter of how it sounds in the end. Hmm. And um, sure. yeah. And, when and uh, you... of course we we know that uh, uh, if you play the wrong note or uh, Fenris is playing, uh, you know, just cock up the, <laughs> the drums, we have to do it again. Hmm. But um, uh, you know, now uh, the last albums we have been exchanging ideas and we talk about. Uh, drums and we talk about and and I send him riffs and so he's kind of well, well prepared in studio and um, so it, it it has been really smooth lately and um, and the thing is like when you listen to uh, Astro Fortress for instance um, you know the uh, and I think it's a stalagmite necklace that has this uh, echo effect on the vocals. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's not a plug-in. It's like a, you know, it's a seventies um, uh, tape echo recorder. Is it's it like really? This, awesome. Yeah, it's like a so like a box, uh, like a, this size, and uh, you have to you know turn knobs, and it's it's an actual tape going in there, repeating uh, the things and. Uh, it's fun, it's fun, you know, to to do, and, and also the reverb uh, stuff is like, uh, it's like real authentic uh, old school equipment, and it's really fun to work with.
and it's it's difficult but it's uh i think it's more fun <laughs> yeah like there's something there's something about something <laughs> there's something about something less perfect that makes something more perfect yeah that's really really hard that's a really hard sentence to say yeah but there's something it's it's the i think the human qualities humans are naturally imperfect and it's about sometimes little imperfections or things that just a little bit wrong sometimes that somehow work better um because you know with technology now it's all about trying to be as perfect as possible yeah exactly and, and, yeah like with exactly. I, I know what, yeah like i know how i just said like with my playing i want it to be as perfect as possible but that's because i'm just a fucking did like i'm just like demonically possessed with trying to get this take <laughs> as as you know as yeah. uh, to the grid as possible but i but i understand like in the in the moment you know that sometimes the little imperfections can work better and it even sometimes works better in the it, it works best in the creative yeah process. but it, it all depends on on uh, what you want to uh, express mm. because uh, of course some types of music uh, requires more precision um and uh i think uh dark one is a bit more like uh, bb king like uh yeah <laughs> we just uh we just go with the flow and you know trying to so uh yeah uh, i know it's uh because different music requires different things and it's it's all about it's like when we had this studio from 2004 to 2019 whatever um uh, I was thinking about it. It will be very interesting to give our equipment to, let's say, Metallica, mm -hmm. and uh, said, "And you know, you can have this and uh, make an album. Good luck, <laughs> because then, then you will get a, a much more um, interesting thing, yeah. <laughs> in my opinion. I think." Uh, you know the, the big bands should take more risks uh, but that's my opinion I mean uh, obviously they, they, they won't take any risk because there's a kind of a billion people of them and uh, there's like uh, 200 families depends on the success of the album and stuff like that and you know okay that's a different thing um, but it, it will be interesting to have a, a band like Metallica record on our equipment a full album. Hmm. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Because the sound, you know, it's like I said this uh, in earlier interviews, but this is like how I see music. It's like, okay, you, you have made an album. Okay, you have all the songs put together, you have all the riffs, and you can compare it to a, to a, a big painting. Okay. And 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 the, the actual painting is the music. It's the riffs, it's the vocals, it's the lyrics, it's blah, blah, blah. okay. But if you are, are going to have a really huge uh, painting on the wall, you want to have uh, you want to have a frame on it, and the frame is the sound. Mm. And uh, you can always uh, just uh, slap, uh, you know, a flat uh, plastic uh, black frame on it. It's very easy. Mm. And it's uh, probably very safe as well. But it's, uh, but that's when I, I would like to have some kind of a exotic wood that you can carve out small details in the, because you want to, uh, so so. Uh, what I'm saying is that the sound is very very important. Uh, of where you want to to take the listener to another place, you know. And um, th there's so many bands, uh, and uh, well, to put it another way, there's so many albums out there that I really want to like, but I, I just I just can't listen to them. Because of the sound, mm. um, it could be that the the the, the guitar sounds too digital, mm. the bass drum is just a huge click, and and then I can't listen to it. 
I'm sorry, <laughs> but no. that's the way I am. I like, uh, um, I like, you know, like, yeah. But, you know, it's something for everybody. There's, uh, you know, especially a couple of albums I know I really like the, the you know, the atmosphere, you know, and the riffs and, and, and the, I understand where this should be going. But the sound is like a huge <laughs> turn off for yeah. me. And, uh, and that's, that's just uh, sad. Mm. No, I can, yeah, I could completely understand where you're coming from. It's like you really want to like it, but something's pissing you off, and it's just something, just something that just doesn't yeah. connect with you in in the right no, way. No, it's 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 all a matter of personal taste, I guess. But uh, uh, it goes without saying that my my, and I think uh, I can talk for Fenris as well that uh, our feet are very deeply planted into the seventies and the eighties, uh, at least early eighties when it comes to metal, but. So uh, yeah, so yeah, we don't tolerate much, uh, you know, uh, weird weirdos. What was your proudest Dark Throne moment? Uh, musically? Um, yeah, musically. I, I meant more in in terms of like the in in terms of like the whole um, the whole thing. Like, what is this? Like, what moment are you so are you like the most proud of? Um, well. Okay, uh, it goes without saying I'm uh, I'm standing one hundred percent behind all our albums. Hmm. I'm proud of all our albums. But uh, what I'm going to tell you now is uh, something that has nothing to do with uh, with music. Hmm. Um, and I think uh, one of them uh, <clears throat> is that. Being such an, call it established band that we are, we have never, ever received one penny from the community or the state to 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 run our our business. Mm -hmm. It's very common in Norway to that that band get uh, money, you know, going on tour, money to record albums, money to whatever. We have never received anything. Everything we have built with Darson is from scratch and it's uh, by our own making. I'm proud of that. And uh, also, uh, I have to mention that I'm proud of we have told our record companies through all these years that our albums shall not. Uh, they they are not allowed we say you are not allowed to send our albums into the we have some kind of a grammys or whatever it's called here in norway as well mm -hmm. uh for music and um and uh they are, have never been allowed to to send our albums in there because uh we think is uh, we think it is uh, kind of stupid <laughs> to be honest uh we don't need we don't need it and um, and also uh, a couple of years uh, i think it was in uh, 3 years ago or something uh, we were picked out by um, the norwegian um, uh, national library in oslo they have they, ha they have this kind of um, uh, they call permanent exhibitions that last 20 years. And uh, I think it was like a 200 people that was, were going to agree on 30 items on that permanent e exhibition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the theme was like a cultural uh, kind of export thing. Uh, and uh, a place in Northern Sky was picked out. Oh right, yeah, I, I re yes, I remember see um, watching something about that in the Helveta documentary. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, that's and I think you know uh, because we have refused to be on this uh, Grammy uh, Spellemans Award or whatever it is. Uh, uh, I think that was like uh, 
because we got a mail from from the national library and saying that uh, we are invited to go to the to the opening of this exhibition and uh, i didn't know it was like going to last for 20 years and um and so so we just uh, at first we just said like okay um we are honored blah 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 but uh it took a couple of weeks and uh some of my family members and, uh, and and others I knew was kind of saying it to me that uh, this is a major thing and I I tried to to uh, to look it up and what was really happening and then I was kind of uh, I was uh, really uh, yeah, it's a proud moment definitely because uh, it's like the the best um, acknowledge you can get from your own country and uh so i think that was uh was a good thing and uh, and that was the moment i also thought that uh we were only 19 years old you know it's a long time ago so that's a that's a good thing it felt good hmm. yeah no for sure no that there's some very very powerful um powerful moments there like it's um yeah like a lot of that is just pretty fucking right on man like i didn't i didn't know that um bands in norway received grants to record albums and stuff and um no it's it's really it's a common thing because uh, and and luckily so because there's a lot of band i don't know uh but uh, it's a very common thing to do here in norway to apply for for this kind of uh, things, but uh, it just because we are uh, we maybe I, I think we're kind of outsiders uh, somehow because we don't want to go get into the party. You know? <laughs> it's just like to stick to ourselves. So um, yeah, but uh, other people might think that we are. Uh, that it's uh, really silly of us, uh, and, uh, but uh, no, we don't uh, need to apply for anything. Uh, we can make our own future, basically. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we, we 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 could easily apply, you know, to to get some support from from the county or something uh, when we started out, you know, to get the instruments. But uh, no, we just um, worked hard to to get them ourselves and uh, then we don't have to answer to anyone either yeah i think you know out of everything that we've talked about i think that's probably the most inspiring thing is that you guys really did work like for years and years and years for the from the grounds up to create dark throne to, to create dark throne and create you know dark throne as a whole the the, the product the entity that is Dark Throne, or, or from basically pure hard work, pure determination, unwillingness to settle for less, and pure drive, and it all was really created by this, these hands. And yeah. I, th I think that's one of the most inspiring things that I've ever fucking heard. To uh, refer to the Scarface movie, mm. um, we are always right even if we are wrong yeah and um, yeah and that's another thing i was going to say like you guys have been making effectively the right decisions um since the start of the band and you know i think so yeah yeah like um look what's become of dark throne and um no that that just yeah that hit differently like it's really really got me um thinking but i love it i i love that the um that the pure grit and determination has Enable, enabled you to sculpt and create your goals it's fantastic and uh, and uh, the thing that we have we have always uh, it's like you said that, it, that there's no real not really any compromises because we we, we can't be doing uh, things that we are uncomfortable with um uh, it's not going to happen so uh, and i think uh, the people we have worked with uh, through the years have, have understood that and uh, so we have we had an easy um, 
easy going uh, you know 35 years really uh, doing what we want to do and um, and uh, it definitely is uh, has been a re really good thing for us and um, as persons I want to bring it back to songwriting if I may uh, mm. so if you're when you're playing guitar yeah. and you're just like jamming around and stuff do you think of drum beats in your head oh yeah absolutely because um, and th this is some of the discussions we have uh, before we go to studio because uh, uh, I always have the drums uh, in my head, and uh, it's like uh, uh, so. So we discuss it, uh, we talk about it, uh, we agree on things, uh, and um, but then again, when when it comes to the studio work, it, it's always like uh, things can happen there. That um, I mean, one one of the one of the new songs. It's like um, some of the riffs was supposed to go faster, mm -hmm. but because of the how the song is kind of tied together, it it did get uh, go slower, uh, and vice versa. Uh, these uh, things happen all the time, um, not all the time, but uh, basically on every album, there's, there's something like that. But we, uh, uh, so we have to adjust to, uh, to make it may may take only one riff, to, to uh, that we have to adjust uh, the the tempo of the song to that one riff because it has to work, and okay, I might have made the riff uh, to go faster. But okay, we can take it a bit slower, and then you know. So we we always ha always have to adjust um, to the situation, and um, so uh, yeah, we do a lot of compromises, I guess, uh, um, in the sake of uh, getting things to to work uh, properly. Because you can't be uh, completely die hard on on uh, such uh, small details because the riffs are the same but um it's especially one of the riffs on the uh, on the newer songs it was uh, was supposed to go much faster but uh it went a bit uh, slower on the album <laughs> but it's okay it's yeah. okay no that's yeah. cool because um for me when i write music as well i'm always thinking about the drums yeah you know, what kind of drums are going to work over this because um for me, when it comes to when it comes to like heavy metal and making music, for like drums are just as important, sometimes more important than the riffs, because a drum because a, yeah, you have one riff and have so many different drum beats behind it, and you've got a completely different feel and mood, and it can kind of fit in different places as well. Um, yeah, it, yeah, absolutely, and the, you know the the I think the. the there's so many options on drums and uh, and so, so you have to think about it and uh, and and um, uh, so so I I usually think about you know uh, drums in general and tempo and 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 uh, but then again I I let uh, Fenris um, do his um, in interpretation of what I'm saying hmm. because he always has uh, good solutions to it and, um, so um, yeah but uh, the drums we are we are this I mean guitar I mean riffs are okay uh, riffs are riffs uh, you can bend the string there or you know uh, it's, it's more settled but drums is uh, is a bit more open for interpretation and <clears throat> But uh, I think we we managed managed to manage it well, and uh, and Fenris is also you know in, he understands where things are going, and um, so uh, yeah, we, uh, there's not not much arguing in studio. There's uh, there's um, 
there's just basically we understand each other and uh, you know i've had conversations with people and uh we're talking about the music and you know i question i, I remember i had this conversation with a, years ago with someone and their their point was why should i listen to the drums if i'm a guitar player and i'm like <laughs> bro yeah. i'm like bro <laughs> like are you, are you well, that's, 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 uh, that's like, interesting i never heard that uh, kind of uh, way okay uh well yeah. well it's uh and there you go again because uh a band can, can, you know, be uh, compiled by very different thinking persons. And uh, I think uh, one of our advantages is like, um, we've, we've been playing uh, for so many years together and uh, we never had the really much uh, arguments, really. Uh, it's been, um, there been a couple of times where we had to decide which of the songs we have that we should uh, throw away, for example. It's only happened a couple of times during uh, 35 years. And, um, and we, we agree on that as well. Because we understand what's best for the album, for the band, for the whatever. So there's no hard feelings. Uh, and... Um, that's the key to uh, to making it work because you have to sacrifice and you have to but of course there's just been incidents where we uh, both of us are more stubborn than than usual mm. and uh, but uh, these things uh, always uh, solve themselves um, but you have to give it a bit of time uh, and um yeah, that's um, that's how it works. You know, uh, Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath, he released a book mm -hmm. not long ago. And uh, I listened to the audio book because uh, it's Geezer that uh, actually uh, read the book. Cool. Yeah. And that's really, really fucking interesting because, uh, uh, you know, Black Sabbath is uh, part of my foundation, you know, in, in, uh, in metal. And... Uh, and uh, it was a great, uh, great experience. I mean, um, and the things, all the things that they encountered uh, was, uh, you know, out of this world, you know. Hmm. Uh, I can't imagine. I mean, it's talking about struggling in the 70s, but a lot of band from the 70s and 80s uh, probably were ripped off uh, a lot um, of record companies and, and stuff like that and it's um, it's an interesting uh, interesting book you should uh, give it a try yeah for sure yeah for sure it's always interesting hearing um, other people's stories and bands and um, yeah no that's something I have to definitely check out at some point for sure um, yeah I know I know he released a book. I think um I think Ozzy released a book as well and Tony Iommi but I haven't read any of them yet. No. But it's a it's a good thing and um no Gizer did a very good uh, good job and um it feels like a very authentic um insight in in what happened and uh, you know, he's starting from the from the beginning where where they met. You know, in a kind of a post-war uh, uh, Birmingham, hmm. and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was very very interesting. I I actually when I start listening to it, I couldn't really let go. <laughs> I had to listen. To, yeah, it's like uh, eight and a half hours or something. Oh sure. See, yeah. that's interesting. I had a very similar experience um, a few months ago. Um, but it was uh, it was Fifty Cent, the American rapper. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he released his kind of audiobook on like success and life and business, and you get really lost into it. And there's so much there's so much knowledge and so much stories in mm. there as well. And it, it re it's really inspiring. It's just like, damn, like this is what they went through. This is their story. This is how they overcame the obstacles. Here's about some problems that they had. You know, when everyone thought every when the whole world thought 
everything's going right for everything's going right and well and good for them it, in the midst of it is just this chaos and it's like what the hell is going on mm. and it's um I, I yeah i just found that really really inspiring and um i'll check if that um audiobook is on um is on spotify something you can listen to it when, when yeah yeah but, uh, I warn you, you, it's very hard to let go when you first start yeah. listening to him. He's, he's, he's a really good uh, talker, uh, Gizer, so, uh, yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's like when it comes to recording equipment, if you take uh, Black Sabbath, you take, uh, you know, the big bands from the 70s, everybody sounded differently because when you got to a studio, there was a lot of studios back then. And uh, that studio has all this kind of equipment, and this studio has all this kind of equipment, and so on. And uh, the band came in with the, maybe their they have their own guitars, maybe and some amplifiers, some gear. And uh, if this band went to this studio instead of that studio, it would probably sound different. Mm. And, that, and that's a good thing because you, you can. It was a much more interesting times uh, because, uh, as we talked about sound, how important that is. Um, it was a good time, and also the start of the eighties uh, with, with the metal uh, scene as well. So, um, yeah, sound is uh, important, and uh, today everything is more streamlined because they they go into the same kind of. Uh, programs and and, and uh, things which make them sound pretty much this you know almost the same uh, there's just you know small differences here and there but, and i think that's kind of a boring thing because um again i want people to i want the big bands to take more chances i mean i'm a i'm a you know metallica fan as well and i think uh you know just because they released the uh, you know the three first albums uh which is uh, <laughs> is insanely good and um so i can't anything else than respect them forever mm. because of that and um but you know it's like uh it's like a question. I mean, if you have a if you had a local pub around where you live, hmm. how much money are you willing to pay to to see Metallica perform the three first album at that small place? You know, in yeah. The, like, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. No, it makes sense. I think. Um, yeah, I think there's it's interesting that you mentioned sound and i found that as well like there's a lack of personality it does definitely yeah. and um something needs to change um but i'm but in this current stage um i i i don't know i've got an idea uh but it's but the thing is if things to change things need to go forward but then maybe the way to move forward is to look back into the past a bit i think it's about time hmm. we should yeah because everything is getting really uh, sterile and um, it's like uh, uh, you know taking the soul out of everything be it cars be it the uh, buildings whatever Everything is uh, become become uh, soulless. Your time in Satyricon. Yeah. Yeah. So, how much did you contribute to the songwriting on Nemes Nemesis Divina? Uh, nothing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was. Um, I think. Um, you know, I was the the guitarist, and um, I. It was me and Frost that the. Uh, we we him uh, frost and me we we rehearsed uh a lot mm -hmm. before recording the album um because again when you come to studio everything is going to click together and uh, it has to be uh, as good as possible so we rehearsed a lot uh and uh in the studio i was um 
you know laying down the the uh, the kind of a lead guitar uh, together with Frost as well. And uh, yeah, that was a was a great uh, great thing. You know, we had a good time back then. And, uh, and uh yeah it was uh, and satirical was like uh, and th this is what i was supposed to say earlier because uh, when it comes to the norwegian black metal scene it was uh, you can hear that all the band had a very different uh, approach uh, mm. to the music uh you know being satiricon or or mayhem or dark zone or um, or uh, Emperor, uh, those bands were completely different. And uh, enslaved and, uh, you know, it's like, uh, but it's very strange that this was happening in Norway. Uh, it's, it's, it's I, I don't know, but um, it's good to think about now uh, because uh, all the, inspiration you know that that came to everybody you know bursum and and you know, everybody sounded differently mm. uh it was uh it was a good time so i think um uh, and and you can hear obviously that uh emperor wasn't uh, uh inspired by dark throne or vice versa we have all our different approach mm. to how to how to you know express ourselves and i think that's uh kind of unique actually when you think about it yeah and that's why i love like the early norwegian scene so much is because it's purely because of the difference it's like you know thorns is always going to sound like thorns and yeah it's always going to sound like emperor and everything was so distinct and yeah. um, even if they were recorded in you know greek hall greek hall and uh the the album still sounded different because e because everyone put like their own personal twists into it and it's going back to um it's going back to personality yeah as well and that's that's why i think um that's one of the reasons why i think that norwegian um black metal uh musically speaking captured a lot of people's attention is because it was so vastly different from everything yeah. that was going on at the time and it's, yeah yeah i think so and um of course, uh, Darsen is the the only uh, band that didn't go to Greg Hall. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, um, I talked to uh, to Pitten uh, several times, and he's a great guy and and everything. But uh, I think we were kind of. I mean, you have to remember that Darsen, we came from more of a i mean it was metal but we, we are kind of uh we came from the from the hardcore punk scene as well so uh, that's where we uh when everybody is doing one thing we should definitely do the opposite oh, kind yeah. of, uh, thinking <laughs> yeah silly and childish but it has worked for us no for sure for sure yeah. just very quickly going back to satiricon uh what's your favorite song of uh, nemesis divina Oh, I don't know. Uh, there's been many, many years since I heard that album now. Uh, I have the vinyl here, but uh, can't remember all the all the tracks. Um, uh, but I think um, uh, what I thought about, because I was on the, the first European tour with Satyricon. Hmm. And um, uh, I think Satyr had the had some kind of problem with his arm so he couldn't play on that tour so i did kind of simulate two guitars um on that tour and uh then i had to learn uh songs from the two first albums as well and uh what strike me about uh, those uh, three first albums is that the, the the riffing was very um different uh very interesting uh riffing it, it was great to play and um and uh but i think uh, nemesis divina uh, came out uh, really really good and um it was like um it's a, it was a natural progression from the two uh, the first two albums mm. in my opinion mm. and uh yeah it was uh it was 
it's it was all good times and i also can remember that um, this was this island outside oslo and um you know uh, you uh, from uh, this this section mm -hmm. he was over there uh, and we had a party together with him and he, he had uh, this um, this uh, kind of a raw mix of uh, one of the albums um storm of the light spain or yes storm of light or... sombalane i think it was the sombalane actually oh cool yeah, he had the raw mix of, of that album, which was extremely cool. Mm. And I remember uh, as the night progresses, we told, I mean, both uh, Frost and Satyr and me, we was tame, don't do anything to this sound. It's so great. It sounds, please don't do anything about it. It's It's awesome. And uh, I almost couldn't recognize the album when it came out, but um, it was a great album anyway. But the raw mix that he came with was like out of this world, great sounding. Uh, it, it, it was absolutely awesome. And I, I also have, uh, because uh, the first time I met Jon, we were, in, uh, I met him at the streets in Oslo mm -hmm. and he was selling the first uh, the dissection single they oh, released cool. yeah and i bought it from him and i have it here and uh and um uh i played it kind of a couple of times uh, many many years ago so it's in in mint condition i like that <laughs> i mean oh, you uh, we, we we were touring with um uh, with dissection on the first uh, satirical tour and uh those guys are absolutely great uh guys and um, it was a pleasure. Yeah, that's um, that would have been one hell of a tour back in the day, early Satyricon and early Dissection. Just... Yeah, and early Gorgoroth as well, because and... they were on tour as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's and cool. we were all crammed into the same bus, so it was, <laughs> uh, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. That's um, yeah. That's really cool. That would be. Yeah, it, it was great, and uh, and the Gorgoroth is, was great, and the Dissection was great. And uh, and Satyricon was great, and uh, it it was um, it was a uh, it was a hell of a tour, but uh, it was kind of cut a bit short because uh, you know the, you know like the the first European tour is always very uh, dirty and uh, and uh, obnoxious uh, experience, and, um, and and you know the suddenly the bus is uh, breaking down, and we had all these kind of problems. So before we was supposed to go to Switzerland and Spain, and uh, we we just uh, aborted the tour actually. Oh man, yeah. Uh, but I guess these things happen. Uh, yeah, can't, yeah, yeah, I can't. But no, that that sounds like one hell of an experience. And um... oh yeah, it was definitely the only thing you can do to keep sane. I mean, after a while, the only thing that really uh, gave some meaning was to actually play live. Hmm. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, otherwise, you could just be be drinking and sleeping because uh, there was <laughs> you get you get easily bored of people. At least I did. <laughs> yeah. No, I can understand. It's like you're stuck in a uh, in a box with lots of other people who are also feeling like they're stuck in a box. So emotions yeah. are always all over the place. And there's yeah, yeah. nothing to do except just sit and carry gear. And then when you finally get on stage, it's such a high. That's like, yeah. Yeah, this is amazing. We're going to do it again. The next day, it's going to be amazing. And the next day, it comes and you're like, oh, crap, not this again. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way. Yeah, for sure. And um, are you going to make another movie like the Misanthro? No. no, okay. I was, uh, well, uh, I wouldn't say no because I'm. Uh, I have, I have uh, a very good plan for it, mm -hmm. and I've discussed that with a with a dude that makes films. So um, if I'm going to do that, it was uh, it, it's not me that's going to be filming it like the first one, but uh, it's going to be uh, equal uh, weird, but it's going to be a bit more professional, gotcha. and. Um, and a bit of a more of a maybe a, a some kind of a uh, it's going to be a bit more planned okay. yeah 
but uh, let's see, let's see. Hmm. I was so exhausted after uh, after the first. Um, you know, I, I used a lot of <laughs> resources hmm. uh, in my brain and uh, and my time on it. You know, building coffins. Hmm. You know, it was like uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember so, that at the beginning of the movie where you're pulling the, uh, the yeah. 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 So yeah, we, let's see. I really like the the charm of the misanthrope because it's kind of um, it's got a Dark Throne style moodiness, but it's so wholesome at the same time. Like you're you're fishing with um, with uh, Grutla, the uh, yeah. enslaved, and uh, you've got like Federis filming, and you, uh, and that was just I just found that so wholesome. And then you, you know you're traveling to Japan, and you've got the ore and the wildlife. Yeah, as well, and yeah, um, it, it was like yeah. Uh... The the point of it was like um, get a glimpse into you know uh, what I was doing basically and and, and I tried to have some uh, I filled myself you know skiing and stuff like that and try to have a kind of a a red uh, line through the the whole thing but uh, it's it's difficult and uh, I remember at the finishing stages of uh, editing that uh, film I was like. I was, I was thinking nobody's going to understand this. Uh, this is like, what the fuck am I doing? You know, uh, people has to be overly stoned to even <laughs> comprehend what I'm doing here. So like, I got a lot of thoughts in my mind. But um, yeah, I released it. And, uh, it was good. It was good. It was good. Uh, um, I don't know. Uh, uh, Fenris has no eyes for for visual things, um, but I do, and um, so that's um, that's why we also uh, always talking about the Darshan cover hmm. covers, album covers. Actually, yeah. Speaking of album covers, um, a blaze in the northern sky. So I only recently found out that the um, that the original image is sideways yeah that blew my mind i think uh, i can't remember exactly how that did happen but i think it was uh, my idea because we were fiddling around with the with the picture and um, and so if you if you turn the album cover mm. one notch you yeah. will have the like the or uh, the picture was actually looking like, but the thing is that uh, when we tilted the picture, it it looks comp. <laughs> it's <laughs> like it's a it's a different uh, thing, yeah. And um, so that that worked uh, really well, actually. Any final words or comments that you'd like to say, or any any bits of advice you've got for people who are learning guitar or want to start bands, or any anything that you could recommend for recommend to people to do and. Uh, or maybe anything that you feel needs or you want changed? I recommend everybody that is uh, starting a band or start learning the guitar or trying to get something together musically that they uh, should do exactly what their gut feeling is telling them. Because when you think that this is right for you, it's right for you doesn't matter the, what the other people think uh, it's uh, because because music should be exactly the thing that this is going to to make your life more wholesome and uh, that's the point of music that's the whole point there's no other point of music it, it just enhances your life and you have to go with it and uh, if people say you're doing it wrong, then you're probably doing it right, <laughs> in my opinion.